been doing some wonderful work um, in the uh, in the area of using tools such as density functional theory to predict correlated uh, electron or correlated states of matter, and this includes work on the study of superconducting materials. And so uh, his work fits in beautifully with the theme of our school. And so without further ado, Alex, take it away. Yeah. Hi, so I'm Alex Rogescu. And yeah, what I'll be talking about are basically um, concepts in the computational study of you know correlated electron materials and superconducting materials, which are correlated. Um, and I want to start first by thanking my PI, James Randinelli, and um, Jennifer Fowley, who is a postdoc in Harold Fong's group, for some discussions on these slides. So the goal of this talk, the way I thought of it, is to kind of give you the tools to understand, say, computational aspects of papers that, um, you know, look at correlated electron materials. So there is a bit of an introduction to, you know, what are correlated electron materials, as well as some technical terms you'll see a lot in some papers, things like self-energy and quasi-particles and so on. Um, you know, there's also some discussion on how we define relevant D states, which are, um, as you'll see, often not actually defined in the same way in different papers, um, as well as the state of, say, AI and machine learning work to discover new materials. Okay, so what are correlated electron materials? Uh, well, some of you might know, or maybe all of you, but the basic point is, you know, you have an atom, usually a transition metal atom. Um, of course, there can be things like rare earth metal ions and so on, but I'll focus on transition metal uh, materials here. And if you have a partially filled D shell, you can have a specific ordered uh, electron configuration in the D orbitals like I'm showing here. So here, for example, I'm showing a magnetic moment. And you need a partially uh, filled D shell uh, because you know if it's empty, you'll have no electrons, no order, uh, fully filled. Again, you won't really have uh, much order here, though there's discussions on, on this I won't get into. Um, okay, so you put a transition metal atom in a material, and it can form a long-range order by interacting with other atoms. So this is basically an interplay of local and long-range physics that leads to a long-range ordered state. So here I'm showing ferromagnetism. The localized states don't have to be orbitals. So you've probably heard a lot of um, recent work on flat bands. Uh, you know, these can be in materials like Kagome materials or bilayer graphene. Um, so here I'm showing this kind of model example in a Kagome material, uh, sorry, in a hexagonal lattice where you'd have this wave function. You know, it alternates plus minus plus minus within this hexagon, but uh, it can't keep alternating plus minus outside of this hexagon, right? So you end up with zero. So it's a localized state in a similar way to how an orbital is maybe a, a localized state. Um, and these flat bands, again, can be the result of a particular orbital overlap. So here I'm showing you know, just a real space representation of one. But either way, you know, correlated electron physics is this emergent phenomena from localized states. And the point is that type two superconductors, uh, which you know, are the maybe the most studied ones right now are the result of this type of emergent order from localized states, as opposed to the type one, which were the first ones discovered, which are usually pure metals, you know, intermetallics, alloys, stuff like this. Um, and one of the things that also makes them interesting, so I'm showing here, for example, a paper from a few days ago in, in Nature is that you can have a complex interplay of superconductivity, magnetism, charge order, and so on in these superconductors. So here, uh, this is magnetism in the infinite layer nucleates. Wait, so key to superconductivity is mod physics. And I really wanted to make sure this is kind of clear. Uh, so what is this mod physics? So take a 1D chain of atoms and have, say, one electron per orbital per atom. All right. So, and suppose there's some hopping T between the different atoms, so the different orbitals here. 
if you um, look at this, you'd say, well, this is a simple metal, right? So you have a half-filled band, the electrons can just hop. So that's that's fine. Um, and you know, if you move the atoms further away, you will reduce the hopping from T to T prime. So as you increase this large uh, to larger interatomic distances, you know that this should become an insulator, right? Uh, it doesn't make sense to keep pulling the atoms apart and still have a metal. So then the question is, how does that happen? And, you know, one, um, so one of the most well-known examples is the pile distortion, which you've maybe um, heard about, you know, in like solid state textbooks and so on. And basically what happens is you have this dimerization of say pairs of atoms. And this leads to a band gap opening. And this dimerization is also associated with like bonding and anti-bonding um, orbitals, right? So the local orbitals might not be the best um, state to use anymore. Okay. One of the, and this also appears in say vanadium dioxide. So it's often unclear what drives this transition um, and you know whether this is electronically driven, whether this is ionic lattice driven, um, and it's an important question, you know, electronic only transitions tend to be faster, right? You don't move the ions around, but I won't go much into this. The key point is you can quantify these things with um, electronic and lattice order parameters, uh, right? The functional, and this is something we discussed in this recent paper, but I, I won't really go into this. The basic point here is, okay, you can have this spiral distortion, but you can also open a gap in other ways. So you can have, for example, magnetism. Uh, if you have an AFM order, well, now you have an even number of electrons per unit cell. And um, again, you open a band gap. But one of the questions is, you know, is symmetry breaking necessary to have an insulating state? So this is where you'll hear a lot, you know, in superconducting materials and so on about things like this Coulomb repulsion U or Hubbard U, which is basically, you, you should, one way to think about it is just electrostatic repulsion between the electrons on your uh, B side. So, okay, what happens is if you have this, then the electrons might have a higher cost of hopping from one atom to the other, and then you basically uh, prevent the material from being metallic, right? So a large U over T will lead to a mod insulating state. And again, one of the things is that many materials like the cuprates are on this um, um, mod uh, insulating state phase. And one of the things is that there's no band picture for this particular mechanism. That's why we need things like computational many body methods. So, you know, uh, there's questions like which mechanism is relevant to make something a MOT insulator? Uh, you know, is it this MOT behavior? But maybe it's not a MOT insulator, maybe it's magnetism that opens a gap, uh, maybe it's a lattice distortion. Um, and the answer is, you know, for any material, it's actually kind of hard to tell. Um, you know, this is also issue in superconductors, we have a variety of phases competing. It's often hard to disentangle what's happening. And this is one of the challenges in these types of materials. Okay. But suppose you have an intermediate U, so you don't actually have an insulator, but it will still have an effect. So that's when you have a correlated metal. So uh, what the correlated metal means is, you know, this, you have an effective renormalization of the hopping and therefore of the bands. So this is one way to think about it. It's harder to hop from one atom to the other. Uh, you have a lower effective hopping. This is a very simplified picture and I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, and one of the things to note is that these correlated metal bands are often called quasi-particle bands from uh, Fermi liquid theory. And I'll, I'll get into why that's relevant. So if you have a paper that has, you know, some DFT result and IPIS results on um, some correlated bands on a correlated metal, you might see something like this. So this is a paper on the strontium vanadate, which is a well-known correlated metal. It's kind of what we benchmark our methods on. Uh, so you'll see here this density functional theory result, these cyan bands. 
and you'll see that the IFS spectra are significantly narrower than the FT. So this is this band of normalization, and this is what you actually have in experiment. And you also have Hubbard bands. Um, so, okay, what are these Hubbard bands and what are these quasi-particle states? So you'll often see sketches like this, where you have these quasi-particle states around the Fermi level, which are basically what you get from DFT, but renormalized. And then you have Hubbard bands that correspond to actually exciting the um, local D-shell by adding electrons. So basically changing from one multiplet state to the other. And that's where you have a variety of tools and methods to um, study this type of um, correlated material. So it can be things like dynamical mean field theory, Gutzwiller methods, subsidiary bosons, and so on. Um, and I personally learned many of these things from you know subsidiary boson methods that are kind of um, very fast and work in MATLAB, so like the code we wrote here. Wait, so what do we uh, do with this? So this is, for example, a paper uh, from Andy Millis on um, comparing, you know, the band structure and spectral function of um, Eudinium nickel oxygen two and calcium copper oxygen two to kind of compare what happens as you go from like the cuprates to the nickelates within the MFT in this um, paramagnetic uh, metallic phase. And again, you see here these bands, these dashed lines are the DFT results, so they're the initial band structure result. Um, here you have the quasi-particle bands, so after you renormalize these bands after performing a DMFT calculation. And you also have these um, Hubbard bands further away corresponding to um, excitations in the D-shell. So I thought it would be very useful to explain uh, what a self-energy is. Uh, because I found this very confusing when I started working in the field and I was reading a DMFT paper and, you know, they'll often um, talk about self-energies. And the basic point is that um, in this um, spectral function, in this real like dynamical mean field theory calculation or generally just Fermi liquid theory, you basically add a one way to uh, simulate the many electron effects beyond the single particle theory is to add a self-energy. So what does this self-energy do? Um, this is usually calculated in dynamical mean field theory and GW, for example, right? So if you think about your usual wave function and you think about you know, how you normally time evolve it, um, when you add this self-energy, the self-energy will do two things. It will have a shift in the energy itself. So uh, this is the real part of the self-energy and you will have a finite uh, lifetime from the imaginary part, right? You have this I in here, you have an I in the imaginary parts, so you have a finite lifetime. And what this actually corresponds to is that, you know, once you excite an electron out of the material, the hole left in the Fermi C will be filled with time. So um, this is partially why, you know, this is called, say, dynamical mean field theory. You have um, this, uh, in some sense, a time dependence. Okay. So if you Fourier transform, uh, what you have here, well, this is kind of, if you've seen densities of states and, and poles and stuff like this, um, your density of states is transformed in this way. So basically the self energy gives you a shift of the epsilon and K, and you also have this imaginary part here, where here I should have put an I in front, but okay. But the basic point again is this is a shift, um, right? Don't know if you can hear the stuff outside. Hopefully it's not too loud or it's filtered out by Zoom. Second one. Sorry? The second one. It okay, great. Yeah, I, I can barely hear myself. Um, yeah, so you have a shift in the self-energy and you have a smearing of the imaginary part. So if you think of just you know taking the absolute value of this, right? You'll have a Laurentian. Okay. So if you look again at the paper, say like the Swanson Vanadate paper, the real part of sigma gives you this, you have a shift, and then you have this imaginary part that gives you this uh, smearing that 
is partially what you see in IPS, and it's this finite lifetime of the quasi particles. Uh, and I should also mention uh, this really cool tool built by Sophie Beck and Alex Hampel uh, at the Flatiron Institute, where you can kind of learn how these things work using um, basically a band structure from DFT or a band structure you, you create. Um, and you can add things like, um, you know, an effective mass for normalization and see how will your bands look like in Fermi liquid theory. So, you know, you have um, this comparison, for example, from, you know, IPIS and the FT, this simple Fermi liquid theory thing that uh, you can do in a few seconds on your laptop in a browser and dynamical mean field theory. And you also have like subsidiary bosons, which are again, the simplified picture I was mentioning. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to mention is, you know, why are we looking only at one or two bands around the Fermi level, right? It seems maybe not the most intuitive thing. So here again, I want to go into some concepts people find confusing. Um, so going back to this chain of atoms, Right. We talked about the spirals distortion, um, the bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, band gap opening. But the thing to kind of remember is these are just H2, like hydrogen molecules at the end of the day, right? So let's go back to this a little bit and I'll show you why I'm talking about hydrogen molecules in a bit. So we have these two hydrogen atoms. Uh, so they each have this one S state and you have a hopping between the s orbitals right so you have you can set the 1s um, orbital on-site energies to zero to just have a nice hamiltonian and you can have this intersite hopping between the two orbitals so you'll have the following eigenvalues and eigenstates you'll have a bonding eigenstate uh, with eigenvalue minus t um, and you'll have an anti-bonding um, eigenstate with eigenvalue t right so this will be the filled one. So the thing to remember is, you know, electron kinetic energy is higher with this phase fluctuation. So you can think of this as a little bit of a particle in a box analogy, if you want, um, where, you know, the bonding state, you know, the phase fluctuates less than in an antibonding state. Of course, this isn't a 1D particle in a box, right? It's um, a bit more realistic. So this would be the electronic structure of hydrogen. And, you know, one thing that is kind of useful to know in these materials is generally bonding orbitals stabilize materials, antibonding destabilize them. And that's why if you'd have helium-2, it wouldn't actually be stable as you'd have this antibonding field. But why am I going into this is because many of these materials have something like this. You have some d orbital and you have a p orbital. And you have, say, some hopping d in between in a particular unit cell. So then you have this Hamiltonian with the energy of the D states higher than the energy of the P states, and you also have this hopping in between, right? So then you'll have a bonding orbital and an anti-bonding orbital. And like before, we can do this um, diagonalization, and you'll have a bonding orbital that um, is lower in energy than the initial P states with an eigenstate that is mostly uh, characterized by uh, the p orbitals is dominated by the p orbitals and while the d orbitals are higher in energy like that you have an anti-bonding orbital and again this is mostly p in character anti-bonding mostly d so many of the bands in in the ft okay this is a super simplified sketch but they'll often be anti-bonding d bands and uh, bonding mostly p bands the lower level under the Fermi level usually. But so what this means is, you know, if you look at the bands, you'll have an anti-bonding band, mostly D orbitals, and a bonding band, mostly P orbitals. Um, but these, you can also think of them this way. If you were to have some sort of atomic-like D and P orbitals, this anti-bonding would be mostly D. The P orbit, the bonding would have some D character, while it's the reverse if you have, you know, P orbitals, you know, there's fewer of them on the antibonding site and more on the bonding site. Uh, and the energy difference between the two is called the charge transfer energy. 
So the thing is that you will have a variety of different types of calculations in, in DMFT and, and so on. Some of them might be full PD models that include, you know, explicitly the D and the P states, the on-site energies, the hopping between them, um, and they'll all be modeled at the same time. Other models will focus on antibonding orbitals. So it's important to kind of, when you read the paper, be kind of careful, uh, because then they might mention things like low energy models or D only models and so on. But what they really do mean is that the focus is on these antibonding orbitals. Um, so to give you an example of why this is relevant, you know, if you have an antibonding picture, if you just shift this energy level, you will shift the occupancy of the full orbital, that's that's all you have. If you have a full PD model, you don't just change that, you also change the covalence. So you can have a more complex interplay. So one famous example are the rare earth nickelates, so the parent compound for the superconductors. So it's R nickel oxygen three rather than two, where you can have an antibonding electronic disproportionation picture where you have the filling of the antibonding orbitals change because that's all you're modeling or you can have ligand holes on the p states as the covalence changes at the same time and the d orbitals like the atomic like ones don't actually change in occupancy so again it's important to keep in mind what people are talking about from paper to paper um, and what they're actually modeling a quick note on this approximation you know here i've used what's usually called LCAO, so linear combination of atomic orbitals. Um, you know, there's limitation, you know, push some atoms very close together. Obviously, a linear combination doesn't make sense anymore, and that's why we normally use um, one-year functions. So if you're not a DFT person and you haven't built one-year functions, the point of using these is because they fully characterize the bands you're interested in with a complete basis set. And here I'm showing an example of an antibonding orbital in titanium chloride, which is a um, dihalide. So you can see here, you have both this titanium D character on the titanium, but you also have the P orbitals on this um, on chloride. And you can see that the phase fluctuates, right? You have plus minus plus minus, so it's an antibonding orbital. Um, right, so, well, this is what they were showing. All right, so again, you can build them in different ways, um, depending on what you want to model. It's usually much more expensive to have a full PD model. Um, and basically, the order of the calculations will usually be the uh, density functional theory, and then you build a one-year model, you have a Hamiltonian, you add correlations to that. Um, and again, dynamical mean field theory, subsidiary bosons, and so on. And you know, you'll see comparisons from one U and J from one paper to the other. And one of the things to keep in mind is that you can only compare U's and J's if you're actually looking at the same orbitals. So an antibonding orbital is much larger, right? So if you have a low energy picture, antibonding orbital, you'll use a lower U in your calculation because, you know, it's electron-electron interaction and something that's much larger, it's going to be lower. Um, Okay, right, so I'll get a bit into the local ionic environment and how this was actually used to understand some things about cupret superconductors and how they led to the prediction of the nickelate ones. So uh, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. Uh, pretty good. Okay, so suppose you have this atom in a vacuum, say copper. You know, it'll have its d orbitals degenerate because, you know, spherical sym symmetry. So that's fine. Uh, you put it in a cubic environment, you can now look at the antibonding d orbitals here, right? So you'll have a crystal field splitting, um, and you'll have these EG orbitals and T2G. So you have this 2-3 split. Pull at this oxygen, you, you have this Yantler distortion. You can also just have this intrinsic to the material without the distortion if you have a rudolson popper compound, for example. Um, and you will have this splitting now, right? So 1-1-1 one, 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 and then 2. So most cuprates are some variation of um, superconducting cuprates of some electron or a holdout version of, of what I'm showing here. You have nine electrons in these D bands. Um, you know, you fill most of these and then you end up with this one electronically active antibonding orbital around the Fermi level. 
And this is what people model, you know, when they do, you know, usually dynamical mean field theory, QMC, and so on, like quantum Monte Carlo and so on. So you can, that's why people think of, you know, this lattice of copper atoms, it's kind of 2D, um, you know, each with one electron per orbital, maybe whole or electron doped, and you perform calculations on that. Um, and one of the interesting things is, you know, you can also think a little bit about um, more than just this picture. So, you know, if you have this apical distance longer, um, as I was showing, you know, you'll, you'll modify this T, so you'll change this charge transfer energy, this um, energy between, um, energy difference between antibonding and bonding orbitals, right? So why is this useful? Well, so this is kind of an empirical uh, rule, but this distance between the apical copper, um, the apical distance of the copper oxide bond, basically, so the copper oxide bond length, sorry, of the apical one, all right, um, controls the relevant uh, electronic energies, right? So the charge transfer energy here. So why is that important? Well, because this is then very strongly correlated uh, with the TC in these cuprates. Now it's not perfect because you know have structures that are quite different, uh, but ultimately this gives you some ideas about the, the design of new potential uh, materials. So, okay, starting from this basic idea that the physics of the cuprates is dominated by this one band, uh, people thought for quite a while about how to design nickel-based superconductors, which I'm sure you know, uh, you've know you heard a lot about and you'll, you'll hear a lot more about. So the basic point was, how do we design a material such that the d orbitals are split in this particular way, but also that you have nine electrons in the nickel? So this was proposed, you know, 20 plus years ago. Um, and, you know, it was ultimately uh, built in Harold uh, Fung's group by just removing the apical oxygens in a rare earth nickelates. And, you know, I'm saying just, but it's actually a pretty complicated process to, to remove these oxygens. But the important thing here is that predictive theory of the electron lattice interactions can lead to uh, new materials. So, I thought I should mention that before this neodymium nicolate um, with the apical oxygens removed uh, was, was first built, there were a variety of attempts, including some I was involved in with some uh, theory on actually trying to design heterostructures that have these properties. Now, obviously these, these didn't uh, work out in terms of getting superconductivity, but I think it's important to kind of think about um, what people had done for about a decade in, in these things. So how do people try to do this? Well, you have this rare earth nickelate here, you know, whether R here might be lanthanum or might be a rare earth. Um, so you'll have some orbital diagram looking like this, right? You have the energy here and you have the antibonding D um, orbitals of the nickel. Um, I picked these spins like this, but it's um, not necessarily ordered. Um, okay, so what people did was, you know, they'd build heterostructures with lanthanum titanate on top in particular. And why lanthanum titanate? Well, because you'd have one electron in the titanium D shell, which is higher in energy than uh, the D orbitals of the nickel. So this electron would go across to the nickel, at least in principle. Um, so now you have nickel having more electrons and titanium having fewer. So this, you can think of it as positive, this is negative. Oxygen is a negative ion. So what will it do? It will go towards the positive ion. So you get this Jan Teller distortion in this way. And we did in fact get this Jan Teller distortion. We didn't get superconductivity. Uh, and this way we get again, um, this orbital polarization. So there are quite a few papers on this, um, some including, for example, um, you know, Mitra Tahir, Chance Hopkins, um, and uh, Ankit, who will actually start a faculty position at Cornell, uh, working on oxide heterostructures and um, ultra-fast experiments. So 
we also worked on similar things with uh, cobaltates. And again, here we didn't get super conductivity, but it was quite one of the striking things was that the apical oxygen displacement here was around 0 0.4 angstroms. So um, this mechanism is actually quite, quite strong. Okay. And, you know, I won't go much into this, but we've, uh, one of the results of this was actually that we ended up focusing a lot more on the study of the metal insulator transition in the heterostructures that resulted. And here I explain a lot about that. Oh, okay. yeah. So the final topic is just what's kind of the status of AI tools to discover, you know, correlated materials, uh, particularly where you don't really have many to start with. And, you know, I've showed you a lot of models, but one of the questions is, you know, are there some biases in our models? Is it something that, you know, we just think of correlated electrons, but then, you know, all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. So we just do it with the MFT on things. And maybe that's not the right model. Um, so the kind of different approach is to look at many materials at once. And obviously one popular tool to do that is machine learning. So, okay, so what's the current status? So there's quite a few recent advances in this direction. So there's a creation of multiple materials databases. We have things like materials project um, and um, OQMD, which are, you know, um, theoretical, you have ICST, uh, thermoelectrics, magnetic materials, and metal insulated transition compound databases. So this is actually something um, uh, we've built. And there's also various ways to describe materials um, that go beyond, you know, kind of standard featureization from PFT, like metal, say things like metal, metal distances or estimates of Hubbard U. So people have various ways to say, create graphs out of a crystal structure, for example. Um, and there's a lot more effort in integrating AI into um, both experiment and theory. And the issue, particularly with high temperature superconductors and these correlated materials in general, is that the current techniques kind of struggle with some of some things, right? So um, one is it's quite difficult to teach um, a computer complex physics. And another issue is that, you know, machine learning methods usually do very well when you have, say, a thousand compounds, right? So we don't get to have that, say, with you know, these type two superconductors, uh, which makes it very difficult to say train in what's called, you know, data poor domains or scarce materials classes um, and kind of expand beyond what we already know. And another difficulty is just in revealing the underlying physics. So even suppose you have this perfect model, does it actually tell you why it's giving you the result uh, it's giving you? And, you know, Another way to kind of think about this is, you know, there's this trade-off uh, in Bayesian optimization. Um, you know, you want to optimize something. Well, there's this balance between exploitation. So exploitation is where you look, uh, where you already have a pretty good idea of what's happening and you think it's close to the optimum and exploration where you go and you um, look at where the uncertainty is highest. So generally, you know, optimization of known materials that are, you know, uh, kind of more um, industrially applicable. And there's many of them. There's, um, you know, things like thermoelectrics, catalysis, um, solar power batteries, and so on. Uh, new compound discovery, like superconductivity, for example, is more in this exploration part. And one of the hopes we have, you know, is that by exploring outside of this kind of say fairly limited um, chemical space of materials we know are superconducting, we might find um, new materials. But again, there the uncertainty is highest, so it's quite hard to push the limit. So there's also recent potential advances in AI research that um, might help. So things like quantifying the uncertainty to guide this exploration. So this is like Bayesian optimization. Uh, Latin variable representations. So, you know, to, to give you an example in, in machine learning, um, these Latin variables are useful to try and find an underlying physics when you don't actually 
have an idea what it is from uh, from the beginning. So to give you an example, if you're building a car and you have different brands of um, tire, you might not know the underlying properties, but what the Bayesian optimization algorithm will do will be to try and find them and will assign some Latin variables that you can then interpret. And another difficulty is, you know, finding physically meaningful features. Like, can we go beyond, you know, the Hubbard U um, hoppings, metal metal distances I was showing and so on. Um, and maybe one of the more um, timely things in terms of like machine learning and um, what I think there's a lot of interest in right now, um, especially in, in funding, for example, um, are potential advances in AI research in terms of interpretable models. And the idea is many machine learning models, particularly say things like neural networks, can be a little bit of a black box. So one of the things that there has been quite a bit of a push towards now are things like, um, you know, Shapley additive, um, uh, I forgot the name, <laughs> like the Shap plots, for example, symbolic learning. Symbolic learning allows you to uh, basically find the underlying formula behind some particular uh, physical mechanism. So the idea is to try and get some a physical picture of uh, the machine learning model you're using or have a machine learning model that actually tries to get the physics from the beginning, like symbolic learning. Uh, so I'm showing here um, some sharp plots. So um, sharply additive plots, I forgot the name. Okay, so we've built some example tools that you can use for discovery of metal insulated transition compounds. So in this paper, for example, you know we have an online database. We have tools that work in Binder. You don't have to install anything, so you can kind of see how to build tools like this. Um, and generally, if you're interested in machine learning, I really recommend Kaggle. And Kaggle is basically a website. Uh, you learn online. Everything is in Binder. Again, you don't have to install anything in there. You both have courses in data science, but you can also compete in data science competitions. Okay, so yeah, thank you. Uh, this is, uh, I hope, gave you a little bit of a picture of, you know, computational physics and where it's heading with correlated electrons. Thank you so much. So we do have some time for questions. Um, any questions from the audience here? If you're online, just uh, put it in the chat. Yeah. Um, and try to speak up. Yeah, sure. it's very hard. Uh, so you mentioned uh, the mechanism of uh, breaking the octahedral symmetry uh, through some kind of tissue circularity uh, technique. Does train play a role in here? Like, is it, if it trains a kind of epitaxial roles that might lead to certain pseudomorphic strain that also breaks the octahedral symmetry? So, did you hear that question, Alex? Uh, that's epitaxial strain also breaks the octahedral symmetry. And is, does that play a role in those? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, that's one of the things we. I was giving a pretty simplified picture, but yeah. So a variety of things can give you an intrinsically broken um, symmetry, right? So if you have Riddleson popper compounds, for example, or you have the neodymium nickel um, with the oxygen too, then you know the z direction is different from the x y. So that breaks your octahedral uh, symmetry. Strain will do that as well. So basically, almost any thin film, unless you perfectly match it, will have some level of that, right? So in these um, super lattices, we're trying to get um, superconductors. We were, well, Ankit was, I wasn't growing anything, right? But they were putting lanthanum titanate. Um, say on the lanthanum nickelate, but that was often on a particular substrate. So, and that substrate was also engineered to maximally like break the symmetry and really um, pull the um, oxygens up, right? So, if you have, say, compressive strain, you will do that. Um, yeah, so you, you can do that. And then uh, another thing that's maybe not relevant for the, the cuprates is that octahedral. Symmetry can actually be broken in two ways. There's also trigonal symmetry where you um, pull at the ligands along the one, one, one direction, and then you actually leave all the metal ligand distances the same. 
but you change the ligand ligand distances and that actually gives you a different basis set um, that you need to use to understand things so that's useful in like 2d halides for example or uh, oxides that are either edge or face sharing for example okay great thank you very much alex so that there we'll get another in person question in just a second there's a remote question which has to do with the the, the connection you didn't talk much about metal organic frameworks or um you know other materials that uh that have been looked at recently so like there's tag made materials right that have instead of oxide linkers have some planar molecule that connect the sites right to make complex things are the same tools that you describe able to be applied to those systems as well or do you have to go to different tools you know so do you have any thoughts on that so i mean i would um yeah, so I know I was looking at some point at the Kagomes that are also uh, partially organic, right? So you should, in principle, you should have the, the same tools. Now, the question is, you know, if you have a more complicated band structure with a lot more atoms, you know, you, it might be trickier to form the initial Hamiltonian, but, you know, there's ways to, to do that, right? So people build, use these tools, for example, for more lattices which are also very complicated so the same tools would work but i would say that um you would want to be a little bit more careful about how you um, build the initial model basically great um could you go back to the uh, graph relating uh critical temperature to apical copper oxygen distance please um uh, yeah yeah, so uh, for let's say like a material like YBCO, is that to say that um, if you are able to uh, like either re reduce um, reduce the apical uh, distance by like increasing the atomic distance between the uh, copper atoms, is that to say you would want to reduce the apical distance in order to increase TC for a specific material and to affect the distortion or uh, am I misunderstanding that? um like if, if you wanted to like increase interatomic separation by say like creating a super lattice would that have an effect on the apical uh distance right so i'm yes so wait so i'm not sure i understand how are you trying to modify the apical distance well I, that's sort of what i'm asking are you able to do that or is that something that's just set based on like the the last parameters okay so here this is set based on lattice parameters yeah Okay. Um, but, and I mean, I'm not aware of studies on this, but I'm sure there are of, um, you know, possibly using strain for this purpose, right? So this seems like kind of an obvious direction, but I'm not sure I know the results in, in this sense, but yes, that should work. All right, all right, thank you. All right, any other last questions for Alex? I see uh, some. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I let's thank Alex again for the nice talk. Thank you, Alex, for coming in. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to pause here and then we will resume with our uh, next speaker very shortly.